Welcome to Product AMA, your daily online Ask Me Anything. We started Product AMA to give those passionate or curious about product management a daily break, something to look forward to. The format is one hour in length, weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. The first 30 minutes will always be a guest and a featured topic. The last 30 minutes is devoted to you, the audience, to ask your questions. So for today, our topic is fintech product marketing, and we have Corby Fine here with us today. So Corby has spent the better part of the last 20 years in progressively more senior positions in, in digital marketing. Started agency side, quickly moved client side, first at Rogers, then CIBC, then Simply Financial. So Corby, thanks a lot for joining us today. I love I love the set. I got to hand it to you. Thanks for the 20-year uh, reference. So that's uh, aging me, but that's okay. Hey, listen, present company is not excluded. We, we, we're, luckily, uh, you got the hair to show, but we're not going to have you take off your hat, okay? No, no, hat stays on today. All right, well, let's get going with some of the questions, and, uh, and we'll see where the conversation takes us today. So fintech, which is really the core of our conversation today, there's all sorts of products that are out there, which we call fintech. But for today, I think just to make it easier on, on you, speaking more to your sweet spot in the consumer space, Let's unpack a little bit the customer segments that are being targeted in this, this ecosystem of fintech products. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the, uh, maybe I'll flip it a little bit on you. So sure. uh, in some respect, every customer segment is applicable to some semblance of the ecosystem of what, what we might call fintech. So uh, maybe take it from the the provider side and think about, you know, what, what does the eco ecosystem sort of look like and, and how is it defined? Um, so at one most basic end, you've got the concept of like the, <clears throat> the, the deposit gatherer, right? So fintech players that are really all about trying to grow their book of business by getting as many people to put as much money in as possible, which traditionally started in like the stored value kind of play and it started to evolve into a more, looks like, smells like, walks like, tastes like uh, a full bank. Um, and so that's where you would see uh, like the cohos of the world, which are pretty much uh, put your money in, we'll help you make it work for you a little bit better, but we're not like a crazy full service sweet bank uh, with all the products and bells and whistles. On the other end, you've got the lenders who are more about, hey, I'll help you as a customer segment, irrespective of where you are in the credit spectrum uh, from sort of subprime all the way to borrow money and so your obvious players there are like your your borrow wells which is hey we'll kind of facilitate a loan but that's kind of what we do and we'll give you uh some digital tools and services to help you facilitate the best choice then you got to get into the investment side which is where you'd really see like the wealth and investment players like the wealth simples which is more investment based so well try and automate or create better efficiency on making you money with your money from an investment and portfolio perspective. Um, and then the fourth bucket I would say in the FinTech space, which is probably the biggest are the, the sort of aggregators and lead generators. So this is where um, you see your credit karmas of the world. And this is where you're seeing a lot of M and a activity as well. Um, who are the organizations that can provide personal financial management, you know, sort of front ends, budgeting tools, uh, bank scraping technology to aggregate transactional data, the, the stuff that kind of like glues the middle together. So any one of us in this chat and anyone in our homes and anyone in our general work environments and everybody we know at some point in their lives will fit into one of those buckets for, for a need. And I think then the big question becomes why them and not just go to your bank? No, oh, thank you. And absolutely, you know, in your in your former uh, your former tenure there at CIBC and Simply Financial, I'm sure you saw both both ends of this. And before we maybe dissect the middle of that experience, I wanted to go back a little bit, and then and then you can bring it forward for us. So, you know, not that we all need the history lesson. I'll try and be brief as possible. But you know, fintech products, as you just explained, not a very new phenomenon. You know, in the retail segment, for me doing a little bit of homework before our chat mm -hmm. today. You know, in Canada, that's kind of where we spend most of our time when, when I think about my own personal experience. But you know, prior to, and you already mentioned, the part of Well Simple emerging. And then if we look back to the 90s, there's certain ING came into Canada and there was Quest Trade still, again, before, before 2000. So all, all of these types of services like direct to consumer, digital, branchless, 
Um, those were all available when we look at consumer banking and the retail brokerage segment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And of course, PC Financial, which is the, the precursor to Simply. I mean, I got a PC Financial account. I remember exactly where it was and, and it was pretty cool back in, I, I couldn't believe it when I looked it up. 1996 is when I first got that. Got that Probably account. at a kiosk in a Loblaw store. Exactly where I got it. Yeah, exactly. 90 90 percent of customers from President's Choice Financial acquired their relationship at a kiosk in a Loblaw store. And even you know, even <laughs> as the the mandate has changed and the bank has gone to CIBC and and the credit card remained with uh, with Loblaws, you still see those kiosks being repurposed. Which is always interesting to how they're reusing that space. But mm -hmm. thinking back to to your role as as the marketer. Talk to us about the marketing challenge that you have in a single product world, you know, where you're just offering maybe checking the savings account versus the multi-product offering that, that we're seeing more and more. I mean, well, simple is one example. Obviously, we know that very quickly PC Financial and then simply you know, branched out into multiple products as well. But I want to focus this next little part on the products you know, that you were responsible for marketing that are more geared toward that top of funnel conversion versus that, that lower down conversion and, and what's needed to convert that low hanging fruit uh, into multi-product customers. Yeah, that's <clears throat> there's a lot to unpack there. So let's- Oh no, we, um, have, we have some time, we have some time. <laughs> let's start with um, a fact. Uh, the average Canadian has 2.9 banking relationships. So I'm just going to go out on a whim and say, Mark, you probably ready for this? Ready? I'm going to put on my mind reading hat. Mark, you still have a relationship with the first bank you ever banked with that your parents took you to the branch to open your kid account. True or false? That is false. Oh, okay. You're like the one in like a hundred. So close, though. Close. the reality is that it's, uh, it's a very, <clears throat> um, uh, it's a very factual statement in this market that if you're born here, you generally have a relationship with that institution. And so uh, let's pretend you did because, wow, you, you totally changed the, uh, the outcome there. Um, the second relationship generally kicks in at the first sort of life transition, which is either going to be uh, I'm going to university, uh, I'm renting my first apartment, something that requires you to like get a credit card, maybe a small student loan. And, and then the third is like the big one, right? It's like the first job, the mortgage, the something that sort of says, I, I need that big institution. So the average Canadian has basically three relationships. So the first challenge from a marketer's perspective is if I've already got the one which my parents took me to, what's going to differentiate me enough and create enough trust and value perspective from a consumer's you know, uh, view that says, I'm willing to actually go somewhere else. And so depending on the product, you get into this, is it a rate and offer kind of play? And so you see this huge segment of the Canadian market that literally will open accounts and jump ship and move money for the incentive. The free iPad, the 2.8% for six months, um, a lot of gamification of the behavior of the consumer for offers. Because if you think about it, the other barrier in this whole ecosystem is there's really no barrier. You can go and apply for a bank account with any bank, you can apply for a credit card with any bank. And if you have decent credit, you can get a whole lot of them. And so the, the term that's used in the industry is share of wallet, right? And position of wallet. Um, and so what spot is your credit card going to be? So there's a whole lot of challenges around the whole ecosystem. So I'll come back to your, your main question. The first issue um, is, uh, do you come across and can you market yourself from a top of funnel perspective as a legitimate trustworthy? put their cash in and not worry about it, right? So things like CDIC insured, you'll notice the big difference between banks and FinTech players that advertise CDIC insured, which means your $100,000 is covered no matter what happens in the world from pandemics to robberies. And you'll see a whole lot of players that don't have that capability. And so the first question is, can you build trust and a belief set that you are uh, sizable, legitimate, and um, of enough warrant to actually take people's money and hold it or give people money that they can trust is actually like legitimate and not, you know, I started watching Ozark last night. That's a whole other game on money flow. But um, so, so that's kind of the one thing. Once you've created that, and I believe the only way to create that is through an integration of mass marketing and digital tactics. There is there is going to be a very hard barrier for a fintech to break through to get massive scale in this country without creating a perception 
that they are a big player. And I will tell you that from a Simply perspective, even being owned by a large institution when we didn't really market it as such, until we put television on, it was, um, it was a very slow growth from the base that came from PC. And the minute you kind of turn on the, the, the flagship of the big brand mass advertising engine, it absolutely created a groundswell to go deeper into the funnel. So that, that is something that really matters. Okay, so that, that helps us a lot. I mean, you kind of blew up my next question. So before I get into it, I just want to remind everyone. So we're talking to, uh, to Corby Fine, a seasoned digital marketer, and spent a lot of time in the fintech space over the last number of years. You're on product, ask me anything. If you have any questions for Corby, you can uh, put them right in the Zoom chat and we will absolutely get to them today. So I'm going to reposition what, what I thought I was going to ask you next because clearly it's not about the mortgage rate. I think that's obvious to me right now. Uh, and, but we're focused again on, on this fintech, this digital bank, if we will, for a moment, and, and whether that bank is doing things like savings accounts, checking accounts, or, or it's into loans. I mean, I'm not really going to focus too much on that in particular in this question. But when we're talking about digital product, because ultimately that's what, that's what these talks are all about, or digital products, how much does the user experience itself come into play at all when people are making a decision to to give their money or take take a loan from a digital bank? And then how much does that user experience uh, contribute to the actual success of the bank? It's a, it's a massive impact in a world of ubiquity, right? So uh, it's a fun exercise. Track uh, all of the bank's rate movement on, you know, whichever bank moves first on like a Tuesday, whether it's a savings or a, or a lending rate, watch every other bank sort of within the next 48 hours in succession kind of follow. Experience becomes an of this use case. You have two accounts. You have an account that you keep your, your cash in and you have an account that you act and invest and buy stock and whatever you do with it. And the experience is on older technology or certain rules in, in place around whatever they call security safety protection, it takes 24 hours to count B. What are all the things that you could miss by not having a transaction oriented versus an account that's savings oriented? And what would the experience feel like if you simply tried to move money from the high interest day-to-day -day checking, which really there's no real difference, except on one you're earning a bunch of interest and on the other one you're able to use it, and the bank artificially puts a 24 hour or an overnight hold because their process works on batch. H how are you gonna feel? Whoops, I just missed a huge upswing in a stock and that just cost me $1,000. So um, experience becomes critical and that's, a, that's sort of a back end process experience. Then you think about what happened to me last week with an unnamed self-directed trading <laughs> platform that when the markets were going crazy, I couldn't even log in. And there was no messaging and there was no tweet saying we're sorry. And uh, yesterday, Thursday, after me sending the email on last Thursday, I got a, oh, whoops, sorry email from some investment advisor saying, sorry, we were really slow because our servers were overwhelmed. So uh, experience becomes really important because you know what I did after last Thursday? I went on a competitor and opened an account <laughs> and moved my money. So it, yeah, it's an, it's, it, the switching, the switching costs are so low and, the, and it's so easy. To coming do. back to my first point, there really is no barrier, which is the barrier to having a successful marketing campaign. Yeah. As you talk about this, I'm, I'm feeling a little foolish to be honest with you. I, I have so many accounts across so many banks, whether, whether it's multiple uh, investment accounts or checking accounts. And I absolutely understand the pain. Uh, as, as probably every single person you know, who's joining us today un understands that pain. So l let, me, um, let, me, let me flip the, <clears throat> the experience thing to another angle. Um, and I think you'll see this more with, uh, with a lot of the, uh, the new incumbents and the fintechs. They almost do the opposite. Doing what most of the big banks do, which is kind of, you know, limit the experiential capabilities of feature functions. They kind of go, hey, here's everything and you can do it all yourself. Which is one thing if you're like Uber and all you do is like order a cab and rate the driver. It's another thing when you're basically trying to uh, create a end-to-end uh, -end daily bank relationship and you overcomplicate things. So like I'm not going to name names, but there are one or two Canadian players who I believe 
functionality that it's like overwhelming. And as we all know, digital apps don't come with instruction manuals. So like you go figure it out. And so I would, I would say like, get some, open them, download the apps, see if you can actually um, figure it out. Cause I gotta be honest, like I'm a half intelligent guy and I've been struggling with a couple of them. No, oh, and you're right. And since I don't have the banking experience, since I was a teller at TV <laughs> in 1997, I could be a little more open with my opinions of the industry. And, and I can tell you that, yeah, I absolutely get lost in my RBC app between my business account, my personal account, my, all the various products that we have in there, uh, the user experience, even in the simple stuff, which is like, you know, I have an RBC credit card and I have a bank account, that, that flow and what they've done to make it look cool you know, really is not what I want. I want more of a, a utility-based experience. But it's, um, but it's something that, you know, as, we, as we're challenged with all kinds of digital products, as we've been talking about for, for all these weeks here on Product AMA, you know, there, there is that concept of feedback and data. And maybe we could just talk about that for a moment at, you know, as, a, as a lead digital marketer, which is what you've been for a number of years. You know, how much of that product feedback is coming to you? And how much influence do you have on making the product better so that those reasons for switching, which I, re I connect more back to CSAT of experience versus, you know, my return on my investments, which are completely out of the bank's control. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, well. <laughs> yes and no. We won't go there. We won't go there. We'll stick um, with, the, with the data and feedback part of the question. Yeah. So um, one of the challenges in, and not just, this isn't a bank issue. This is like a measuring client experience issue, in my opinion. Um, when you ask people, their opinion of the experience in the digital channel. It's hard for the average consumer to separate the experience in the digital channel from the overall experience, which includes, am I making money? Or was the human being that I spoke to at the store, which caused me to go online or at the branch, which caused me to go online. Like it's, it, it bleeds in. And so one of the critical factors is um, uh, being able to separate the uh, terminology, the words, the use, as you do some sort of like analysis on open-ended questions within things like NPS surveys. And so you'll find, and, and I found this back from my telco days all the way through to bank days, you know, it's not uncommon that like 40% of commentary actually doesn't directly relate to the question you're asking, which was, how was your digital channel experience? Because we do a crappy job of asking it like that. We say, how was your experience? And they're like, oh, last week it sucked because I had a bad experience at the retail, but the digital was okay, but it's the bad one that I remember. So you need to be able to have really good analytics to parse out the true uh, experience stories from when you ask customers. And then it's not that complicated to correlate that by actually looking at, uh, looking at the, uh, the web track, uh, a digital transactional, sur a digital NPS survey, and then correlate that with the actual click stream of what someone tried to do and say, are they talking about that experience? So if they're talking about, you know, one of their products and in that session, they didn't even look at that product, you probably have a bit of a disconnect. And many of the modern day NPS platforms that are digital based, whether it's Qualtrics or whatever, actually have the ability to connect that, uh, that session through whatever IP you're, you're using. Yeah, and I would say that on the, on the outcome side, so the stream of data that comes from activity, that's absolutely a way to go. I wanna get your perspective on, on another you know, very common practice in product management, which is user experience uh, interviews. Yep. And, and is that, and I'm not talking about usability studies, I'm talking about uh, product team, marketing team, sitting with a customer, asking them some you know, directional, but, but not, too, uh, not too specific questions to, to get feedback on that experience live. Is that something that, that you saw happening within your, your banking experience? Mm -hmm. um, not as much as it should. And I would say it, it definitely happened from a usability perspective, like a lot of usability testing. Again, coming back to the fact that if 90% of your day-to-day -day interactions with your bank are being done via self-serve and mostly the app, you better make sure that, per my comment earlier, there's no instruction manual, manual that when you put things in market, it's pretty self-evident. So usability, but in terms of like product definition and construct, I think you're finding financial services is much more, uh, they look inside and they look at themselves and look to say, hey, like we kind of know what our customers want because, uh, either we see it as a pain point or we see competitors in other markets doing it. So let's kind of fix or follow. Um, but net new, like real 
uh, real product construct ideation amongst those groups. I, I didn't see it as much as I, I would expect to see it. Well, that's okay. I think Lee, just in rhythm, just for a note, let's try and get someone from uh, Scotia Digital Factory on here. M maybe they have some more progressive experience than Corby does. So we do, we do have a question or a couple of questions. And I, I've I been to the factory too. I, I know how they work. <laughs> all right. Well, we don't want you to talk out of school here on our, yeah, it's uh, all good. On our recorded <laughs> Zoom call. So uh, I apologize if, I, if I'm not saying the name right, but uh, Faze, I, I believe, is how it's pronounced. So Faze is asking a question about, um, about the, how you productize um, with, with digital products, the, the various uh, fintech products that you have. So is it better to have you know, one kind of uh, kitchen sink experience and I'm going to say RBC was that experience for me versus a little more of the utility based experience. And I'll just going to throw well simple out there because I have a couple of those accounts. Whereas one is more the, the, the savings account and one is the, and one is the tradings account based, uh, based app. What, what's your opinion on one versus the other? Um, so I think there are best in class capabilities for those that care about having best in class capabilities. I think, it gets a little complicated and I'm not sure of the intrinsic value that you get out of having multiple accounts with multiple institutions uh, other than uh, the flexibility. So, so the flexibility of moving money for different purposes, <clears throat> which to be honest, for the next two years in this country, given what's going on, you're probably not going to see a lot of because uh, the notion of promotional interest and sort of rate hopping to get, you know, higher interest savings from one bank to the other is, it's pretty much dead for a little while because nobody can afford to pay that out under current uh, economic conditions. But I think specific things like the trading example is a good one. Um, trading platforms are not that simple. And a lot of the differentiation in trading platforms comes down to two things. Uh, speed. Right. So um, if there is a platform out there that's going to, for the same transaction cost of 495 or 895 or whatever you're paying for the transaction is going to give you professional level investment advice. They're going to give you budget tools. They're going to give you push notifications uh, that are guaranteed to be faster with a click response to automatically invoke a trade. If they're going to give you biometric login so that you can get at your, Oh my God, you know, my Yahoo finance is warning me. I better watch something like whatever, whatever the thing is that matters to you. That's where, and it comes back to your experience question. Those are experiential things that are absolutely going to differentiate because every stock tra trading platform can buy and sell on NASDAQ and the TSX and, and, and they can show you things on a 52 weighted average and blah, 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 blah. But if you can't log in and or you're missing information, you got a problem. And so right. that, that's where I think long tail stuff is more, in, more important in, in the choice of diversification. Uh, you know, I'm glad you really brought up those, those examples like notifications on a trading platform. We, we've had the, the pleasure over the last number of weeks to talk to people who are more in the live event, real time space. Now they were more focused on sports and entertainment, but still we were talking about utility. So it was around like getting your ticket. So if you wait, when you need to access the ticket in the app, like it better work, you better be able to log in. There better be the single sign on to, to get into well, Ticketmaster was the example we were going sure. through. And that's, and that's live in the moment. And from what, from what we all know is when you're trading a stock, it's, it's even more critical because whatever the reason is, you, you want to make that move and make it now. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a pretty woman, Julia Roberts, like big mistake, right? It's like, <laughs> it's, you know, for anybody old enough to know what the heck I'm talking about, it's like sometimes you miss a really big opportunity because you just make the wrong assumption or you're too slow to like realize what's in front of you. And so I think from a product feature perspective, those are the little things that, that ultimately will make the biggest difference. And in, and in financial services, like I, I like the fact that every time my credit card is used, I get, the, I get my credit card uh, notification pop up on my screen, which kind of from a safety and prevention perspective also kind of says to me, oh, the bank cares about my security and gives me the choice. And it also for my use says, hey, maybe somebody just used my card. And then I know to go knock on my son's door and go, dude, did you just spend another 12 bucks on Microsoft Xbox points? Cause his, my card's on his phone. So there's, you know, there's utilization of these things that are meaningful for the individual. And so again, when you think about what's important for you, um, if you're, if you find something that's single use outside of your kind of day-to-day -day bank relationship, there's really no reason you shouldn't take advantage of that. Oh, and thanks for clarifying that. These are all the small things that 
I mean, I'm sure the people we attracted today, they're already interested in the, in this subject and uh, we're just helping frame it from someone with all the experience who's had to try and sell it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's all the things that we go through and all the micro decisions that we're making day in, day out. And some of them we're taking a little, a little more for granted than we should from what it sounds. So I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, they can ask them in the Zoom. We have one from Keith that, that I'll bring up now. So we talked a little earlier about maybe your direct experience in, in the banks that you were a part of with, with the lack of discovery around user, reach, user research and whether it's design thinking or design sprints or prototyping, like those kinds of things that are very common to the calls that we've had over the last number of weeks with product people. It, it sounds like there's really not enough of that done from where you've come from. And you, you did mention that you make, made a stop through the digital factory there at Scotiabank. So maybe if you could help us from, from your knowledge, because I assume that you, you were uh, hobnobbing with peers of yours while you did your time you know, in the fintech world. So do you have a sense of some of the companies that are doing that, that kind of product development, that are taking a user-centered approach, that are kind of building the right product instead of focusing on building the product right? Yeah, well played. Um, <clears throat> so don't take my comment of we didn't do it. So we actually had a full live labs uh, implementation of a team and physical office space at Mars. Um, I would say so you that the box of you're at Mars. So you're obviously innovative, right? So, and, and it did operate in a, in a, uh, agile design thinking model. Um, like, you know, the entire wall was wrapped with the stories. And I think the biggest issue isn't setting it up. Um, the biggest issue is it's, it's twofold. It's to the comment you just made, are you building the right product? So, you know, garbage in garbage out. So if you're not sourcing, from a broad enough and differentiated enough pool of people, you got a problem. So simply was interesting. We actually ran a, a 2,500 person online uh, panel all the time that I could go to four times a month with questions, inquiries, ideation questions, user experience reviews, whatever. And it wasn't like in depth, but that would at least be something that we could bounce concepts and ideas. The instantiation of our, <clears throat> of our live labs, which is a CIBC shared with simply, um, uh, team definitely ideated by looking at best practices by looking at global use cases by asking consumers but you know again I think and this is pretty much for all FIs and, and if you look at the average like look at the experience of the majority of the people that are starting fintechs right now they're pretty young they haven't worked in banks and they approach it from an engineering perspective. And so um, I've actually talked to two CEOs of two of the large well one of the larger uh, full service digital bank platforms in Canada and one that is uh, in the process of building their platform out in Calgary, which will give you the answer to who that is. And I've had the same conversation with both of them because it was more informational. They were both asking me, you know, for opinions and thoughts. And I said the same thing to them. Like, don't forget that at the end of the day, your customer is not you. It's not a $14 million to build technology. It's someone who's going to have to, to buy into the story that you're trustworthy and functional enough that they're going to put their potentially life savings into your ecosystem. That's like not ordering food for dinner on Friday. That's not, uh, you know, um, even in a, a transactional investment platform that you put a few thousand bucks to see what happens. Like these are players going after like day to day bank relationships with millions of Canadians. And so if you haven't spent the time to truly identify the entire journey of from someone thinking about what am I going to do with my paycheck? How am I going to save for my taxes? Cause I'm an independent, you know, contractor. What do I do with the side cash that I make from my gig economy side hustle, driving Uber every Thursday night? Cause I have nothing else to do and I want to get out of the house and avoid my kids. Um, like what, all of those real life use cases are, are examples of things that the average person working in a bank today does not experience. And so it's critical that they actually open their eyes to the fact that they are not their own customer. And I would say from my experience, that's probably one of the biggest challenges in FIs today is the ability to actually just make that uh, realization and accept it <laughs> that you are not your own customer. Yeah. To be fair, Corb, you know, the, that echo chamber, which is a, is a word that I throw around, which, which is what you're talking about, it's common in all sorts of businesses. We've been fortunate on Product AMA. We've got to hear from a, a couple organizations. I mean, I'll flag one that, that, um, that Lee Garrison let, let a chat with earlier this week, which was Law Blah Digital. And, and they, they've certainly progressed beyond that echo chamber. I think that that's in the DNA that they got to build. They're a newer organization than you know, CIBC, as an example. 
But I want to I want to get into some of the other industries that you've been a part of. I also want to recognize that uh, Mick and and Faze have put uh, additional questions for you in the chat, and we're absolutely going to get to them. But they're just part of a question that I want to ask Corby toward the end of our chat. So bear with us, and we absolutely will get to them. So Corby, you've been you've been a marketer on a national level for a while now. I right? I know that, uh, and I know the experience is varied across all kinds of different industries. So I want to paint this this picture. You know, whether you're a telco or a bank or a national retailer in Canada, you're, you're all generally trying to target the 12 plus million households in Canada. So when it comes to digital marketing, and, and you've worked in two of those three categories that, that I that I just mentioned, right? So when and I shop, to, shop in the other. So there you go. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so when, when you when you look at this the the market. Is there really a difference between the, the tools and the tactics and the technology that, that digital marketers are using? And, and just to paint the picture for everyone so we can use some household names, you know, is it as simple as Google, Facebook, or Adobe Salesforce? Like, is there anything more to it that we need to know about the decisions that digital marketers are making in their tech stack or in, or in their distribution strategy for their media buying? <clears throat> so the tech is mostly the tech. Um... I think the biggest differences are in a couple of areas. Uh, one is in policy, one is in data, uh, and one, one is in um, sort of willingness to innovate and take chances and risk. And so let, let's, let's talk about those. <clears throat> um, everybody can go and license uh, uh, a, a data management platform, whether it's from Salesforce or Adobe or an independent partner. There's a bunch of small players or some good Canadian um, tech as well. And the whole notion of a DMP is to do a couple of things, right? One is to collect all of the behavior of all the visitors to your digital channels and to build segments off those, right? People who log in every day, people who log in every day and do three transactions, people who log in every day, do three transactions and do four transactions on mobile and spend over X, blah, blah, blah. like whatever the, the behaviors are that you want to like, Oh, that's interesting. What am I going to do with that? How do I personalize and create relevance for those customers? Uh, the second thing though, that it does is, <clears throat> and this is where it starts to, to bifurcate. It also allows you to take data that might be deep in the bowels of your business. Like what products do they actually have? How much money are they worth? What's their credit score? Uh, are they male or female? Do they like soap operas? Like whatever it is that <clears throat> lives sort of deeper in the bowels of your organization. And so the policy comes, do we as an organization uh, want, to, want to use or choose to use that kind of information to create differentiated kind of marketing experiences for our customers? And so the, uh, the more m modern thinking, maybe is the word, uh, organization will say, like, let's take your law laws. Well, they'll say, huh, well, if they buy lots of baby carrots and the last three years of transactions, including in retail, because that little thing called Optimum, they can centralize your digital and your physical transactions. Let's expose that into this data digital platform. And when we market, let's not market carrots because they're going to buy those anyway. Let's market dip. Because, <laughs> man, everybody who eats carrots needs some dip. And that experience or example, now you take that to an organization like a bank and you say, um, hey, this person is constantly getting to like the bottom 10% threshold of the cash in their checking account. Do we want to use that information and proactively push them uh, overdraft protection, an unsecured line of credit, or maybe even more so um, some sort of loan product that gives them enough bandwidth? The answer should be yes. And you still see though a lot of policy and then the third piece, which is like risk tolerance in most banks saying, well, I'm not really sure we wanna use that kind of stuff for product sell. It should be there for experience. Like we should send somebody a text message that says, hey, warning, 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 uh, you're getting really low on your cash in hand, but there's this balance between that as a service message and then the cross sell messages, but here's what we can do to help you. And um, I think that's really the biggest differentiator is the utilization of the data, the policies in your organization around using it um, and willingness to expose it into these channels that some people are still very fearful of from a infosec perspective. And then uh, personalization and the cross sell upsell against the use of those, those, uh, those data points. Thanks for painting the picture. And then there's another part to the story and you touched on it, but maybe we'll specifically address it. 
I understand there's also a, a movement for um, for large large companies. I mean, I know maybe it happened a little bit at CIBC from my limited understanding. I Again, at Canadian Tire, might be the same person who we both know who's helping me understand these environments. He might have been a guest speaker in my Schulich MBA class a couple times. Uh, but if you could talk a little bit about, about that data and security and when it comes to this concept uh, of media buying and DMPs and, and this movement, because that data is so, um, is so important and the protection of it is, is critical to all of these businesses' survival, that movement from agency supported uh, digital marketing to bringing in house, you know, are you, are you, are you partly to blame? Are you driving that? Or is it, is there something else at, at play there? Uh, so say that probably three, six, seven years ago, uh, that gentleman and myself were partially responsible for getting, uh, Google and Adobe for the first time ever on a global basis to do a server to server synchronization of their cookies. How's that? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think when I think back to Rogers and, and one of the things we did, which was really interesting was we were like pretty much the first, you know, major corporation to bring programmatic marketing in house and build the concept of what today is like the trading desk. And, and, um, now you're looking at, you know, 85% of like fortune 500s essentially do the majority of their media buying digital in house. Uh, a few reasons for that. Um, you're going to see, um, you're going to see key uh, efficiencies in terms of the KPIs. And the main reason is, you know, are you willing to give lists of information of customers and prospects to an agency who also represents 32 other companies that even though there's theoretically like a black box and a bunch of walls, like, can you trust that it's not helping or bleeding into any other areas, even without intent? Um, I don't know, maybe. Uh, you're going to see transparency. So you know what you buy, you know what works, you know how much you're paying for it. And you can make those adjustments on your own without having to have someone else aggregated into a report for you and maybe miss a few things either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and so it gives you the facility to use a bunch of the data without ever leaving the building, which should alleviate that whole notion of like risk and fear on exposure and, and leakage. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you do shouldn't still be considered um, with the utmost of, of security protocol. So everything obfuscated, everything sort of hashed and encrypted, every, like nobody needs to know that segment seven is made up of how much money people spend a Canadian Empire on their debit card every Thursday. They just need to know that segment seven has a propensity for these things in the channel. Um, and so that's, I think, the big difference. And if you know that people spend a lot of money in Canadian Tire and they do good things with their finances, you kind of want to go to the, the Facebook or the Google ecosystem and start to build lookalike audiences. But what you never want to do is have uh, an intermediary understand or take a list of emails or hashed sort of data points to say, these are people that spend a lot of Canadian Tire. So, so I do believe killing the middleman just from a security safety perspective does have a lot of potential benefit, but it's really the actual optimization and the hitting of your KPIs that winds up being the, the sort of real reason you do it. So thanks for the explanation and debunking any myths that, that might've been out there. And for those folks on, on the Zoom today who have more of a business focus in mind, uh, I, do, I want to say it in just layman's terms, which is, it sounds like, although the segments might be very sophisticated and algorithm driven and real time and all these great buzzwords, what it sounds like, it's really just based on what are the business outcomes that you're looking to achieve. That's important as the characteristics that you share with your marketers as they make those, as your product marketers make offer decisions, you know, as your, whoever's doing the media buying chooses the audience for those offers, whether that's owned or paid. I mean, it's really more about what are you trying to do for your business to drive the bottom line? Is that <clears throat> fair to say? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the most basic non-technical use case that I, I use all the time and have for like seven years, because it's still relevant, is, uh, and it actually helped me get the job at the bank. <clears throat> I walked into my final presentation for my job and I pulled out my wallet and I pulled out, I'd been a CIBC Aventure card holder for 12 years and I'm standing in a boardroom and I've got the CMO and the SVP of digital and the head HR and like, like say seven execs at the table and I put my PowerPoint on the screen and it was my, it was my, the homepage of CIBC.com and my homepage of my, my, my account. So like post login, the sort of first view of all your accounts from that morning. So I pull my credit card out and I look at the there and he's a great guy and we're friends. And I, I hit the switch on the, on the, hit the button on the presentation. And I said, this is the homepage this morning. 
And the big ad on it was get a CABC Aventura card and get 15,000 free points and no first year fee. And I'm like, okay, I'll give you the breaks on that one because you kind of don't know who I am before I log in. I'll, I'll give it to him. And then I hit next. And it was my personal view of my, and the right rail was a little ad that said, get an Aventura card and 15,000 free points. Yeah, and we, and we, I said, and all I did was like, I looked and I looked and he puts his hands on his head and he goes, I should be fired. So, you know, I think the whole concept, we think about AI and, and sometimes it's as basic as build the segments with the binary crap of product is in the hands of the customer. So build the homepage or the advertising rules don't show that person or those people in that segment the same damn thing they already have. And not only does it make them happier, not only does it stop yourself from shooting yourself in the foot and getting complaints and people going, well, I want a free year, you're offering it. You save money because you're not wasting advertising and paid media against people that are never gonna get the thing anyway because they already have it. Yeah, well, thanks for, thanks for giving us the example. Congrats on getting, getting that gig. We actually had a couple <laughs> product AMAs already, which uh, dealt with that if you're interested. There was one on personalization a couple weeks ago. And then even our first week, we had another company called Trial Fire who was on, who was talking about their product to uh, be able to target anonymous traffic even, uh, even before they've converted. Anyway, a couple, couple tidbits for anyone who's looking to learn a little more on the topic. So getting back to the questions that we had, and um, maybe some of these are easier than others, but I absolutely want to get to them. So Faith had another question which was about, um, about the trading space in particular, if you had an opinion on, on Wellsimple and Robinhood, which you may be aware of in the US, and, yep. and just if you really think they're, they're threats to the larger financial institutions. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, I think the Robinhood example is an interesting one. You know, they, they kind of went at the free trading play and the way that free trading platforms make money is twofold. One, they'll make it on foreign currency exchange. So if you bought a non-US stock uh, and they were buying, let's say Canadian dollars or euros so that someone in the US using Robinhood could trade on a foreign exchange, they would bake a bit of a currency conversion fee to make money there. And then they would actually make money on the float of all of the cash that's sitting in the account before you trade it. So if you're sitting on never trade, you'll generally notice their interest-free accounts. It's just, so the, they're actually investing that money and making a couple of points. Um, but the thing that happened with them is then they quickly had to pivot into day-to-day -day banking accounts. Uh, and the main reason is there's not a lot of money when not a lot of people have a lot of money to put into these self-directed trading accounts and, and actually, you know, earning 2% on the average investor's account in the U.S., which is not going to be a lot of money when you really break down the numbers. It's kind of hard to, 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 to keep an operation. Uh, Wellsimple is coming at it the other way. They're actually, they've launched the Wellsimple trade platform, which is also a, a no fee trading platform on the back of having about a 6 billion, billion with a B dollar book of business on the investment side that is the robo advisor. And now they're trying to figure out what else can we offer from an experience, more money into this funnel. So free trading, free day-to-day -day bank accounts. Um, I've personally used the Wellsimple trade um, platform. Um, uh, coming back to the experience play earlier that we talked about with the inability to make a transaction, I think there is something to say you get what you pay for. And uh, I was not able to make a transaction. And then, and I'll give you a real experience. And if Mike hears it, he can call me. Um, <clears throat> I hit the button to make the transaction and I got an error message. So I logged back in, did it again, and I hit the transaction to buy the same stock and the same amount. And I got an error message and I'm like, I raised my hands, I threw up. And that's when I went to one of my other platforms. This was literally last week. And the next day I got confirmation that I had bought both of those stocks twice. Not acceptable. Right. So do I think they're a threat? Um, not right now. Not right. not right now. And it's I think it's because sexy. of the they, investment. They yeah. Hey, listen, and in, in Toronto and in Canada, they are, yeah, they're a great platform for what they are. I think they just got to be careful about um, being able to handle the expectations of their customer. And again, being a software engineer is not necessarily being an, an, a self-directed investor. Well, thanks for that. And Nick has been waiting uh, patiently for, for a question that was posed and um, you, you help us. You'll, you'll do your best to answer this question. <laughs> yep. I know, I know you're, you're moving between a bunch of businesses right now and I'm going to ask, actually ask you about that in a minute. So don't completely uh, uh, give it away. All right. 
So uh, Nick is asking in terms of right now, you know, we're all working from home and just an opinion on the impact of, of ideation and, and agile teams, given all this, this isolation, what, what, what's your opinion perspective on that? Uh, you know, I think, I think the, the thing that I've noticed missing is the, in sort of trying to get things done and, and work in this kind of a, an environment um, is the ability to just like get up from your chair and go <clears throat> and talk to someone um, and, and then just get things done. It's really, it adds a lot of complexity and it's been very hard to think about um, uh, how do you go and find that person you need when they might be homeschooling their kid uh, in the middle of a class. And so like, it's really hard to know what other people are working on when you're not con constantly connected to them or physically able to just get up, grab a coffee and walk over to their desk. And so I think that's been the biggest problem. So I think if you're still aligned on a common goal, you have one project and one focus and you're constantly connected, distance doesn't really matter. But the reality is we're all working on like multiple initiatives at the same time. And so I do think that there will be some level of productivity hit, not on things that were already started before we all got locked down, but on starting things from scratch while we are in lockdown. Yeah, well, listen, thanks for the perspective. And I, I think we're, we're getting to, we don't have any more questions really from the chat, but I abs absolutely have a, have a closing question. So for those uh, who, of you who don't really know Corby and I, and uh, I don't suspect many of you know us too well at all, <laughs> but, uh, but I've known Corby probably the better part of 30 years. Um, we never worked at the same place. I think I left before close. you came, but we got closer, Rogers. We got close, <laughs> and we, but we've absolutely been in touch uh, all along the way, all along the way. So I'm really grateful for that. So as our careers have evolved, you know, you're, we're both in interesting places right now. And I know you're a little newer in that place than I am, but why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you're up to kind of right now and how kind of what we're, what we're all going through now has affected your productivity and ambition. Um, yeah. So um, I have uh, uh, basically been in the sort of transition of trying to figure out um, you know, from a career perspective, uh, how do you how do you balance um, to your point twenty years of experience in different verticals, and start to do a couple of things? Uh, so, uh, started working uh, with a financial services organization, which I, I will announce soon, um, <clears throat> that uh, really needed a lot of help around. Um, I'll, I'll use the word digital, but I'll, and I'll use it from a couple of angles: uh, marketing from like customer acquisition strategies. Um, channel operations from the notion of like content marketing, social, um, uh, you know, user experience and design, nav layout, feel like creating a good, good vibe for the customer. And then um, the digital product. So the actual application flow, the optimization, um, the, the whole funnel itself. Uh, and then ancillary services that are digital only in a financial services business. So your tools, your widgets, your calculators, your, your sliders, the things that are actually going to grab attention of customers and then potentially some digital only actual products like financial products that are digital in nature. And so at the same time, um, you know, I took advantage of some of the downtime in the last couple of months and started a podcast. So, you know, I'm kind of the person who likes to test things out. And so, uh, you know, these, these mics right here are part of my little home studio and, um, man, it's amazing how, uh, how much fun that's been as well. So I think what I recommend to everybody in this time is, you know, instead of the commute, whether it's in a car or a bus or a subway or a walk or a bike, take advantage and, you know, try something that you kind of have been thinking about wanting to do for a while that is somewhat related to making a living, you know, today or in the future, but it'll keep your mind stimulated. And when your kids are screaming in the next room, cause they're fighting with a friend on, you know, video uh, classroom 101, um, you can just like put these things on and, uh, and not worry about it all the time. So that's kind of what I've been up to. No, that's great. No, I've, I've been following and I wish you you know, success in what you're doing. Hopefully it all pans out because um, uh, you deserve it. You certainly have the experience in FinTech that we heard today. I cannot believe a lot of what has come out of your mouth considering you know, the last time we really spent some time together, you were in media and the world looked <laughs> very, very different. But we, we do have a few minutes and Zara has asked a question, which is all part of kind of the here and the now. And, uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to kind of intro the question because there's, uh, there's a few pieces to this that I'll, that I'll say. Uh, these small business programs as part of the, the response of the, of the government to helping all of us through through COVID-19. You know, we've gone through the application process. There's no, there's no communication. There's no status update. There's no nothing. So maybe talk to us a little bit, not so much about the, the incumbents, but maybe 
may, maybe these the the newer players in the market who are just better at user experience and design, and, and perhaps uh, paint a picture of the role that they can play to help those slow, very slow moving <laughs> ships, which are known as are they still called the Big Five? The Big Five banks. Big Six and, now. Big Six, sorry. So just help us kind of paint the picture of what smaller, more agile, um, what I would call user-centered design financial institutions could do to help those, those ships move. So we're not all caught in what I would call, you know, the tsunami of paperwork, which absolutely is, is following this first wave of applications last week. Yeah. So <clears throat> you, you hit a couple points. Um, so there's about 1.2 million small businesses in Canada, which are like uh, under 100 employees. And I think what you see is the majority of fintechs in this country have actually focused on the consumer play. And so <clears throat> the, the opportunity while the consumer is sort of, you know, hitting high percentages of, of sort of unemployment and hunkering down and not really spending money is there is a huge amount of like really talented uh, set of people and organizations who understand the fintech ecosystem, but maybe haven't really built out for the, you know, this kind of small business play. And so I actually do think that the, the maybe less agile big six and the more agile, you know, small, whatever it is, 50 or hundred have a huge opportunity to think about partnership. And so what do the big banks have? They have tons of customers, tons of data, uh, tons of connectivity to those customers, day-to-day -day interactions. What do the small fintech players have an ability to build shit fast? They're very nimble. They're quick. They're agile. And what an interesting synergy to say a big six essentially asking for help and finding ways to partner with uh, fintechs right now, which would also keep employment going for those organizations who otherwise might be less busy, um, would help facilitate less JavaScript errors because you'd actually get things done faster. Uh, and I actually think the learning for the fintechs in terms of building out things like um, you know, audit trails, infosec requirements, um, sort of having chief security officer oversight. Like I, I've talked to a lot of these fintechs, they don't have a, a CSO function. Well, good luck trying to cut a deal with a big bank if you don't have a CSO and a dedicated team that's there that if something goes bad, like a data breach, you have reaction. The, the average fintech startup person will say, oh yeah, that, well then it's everybody's job. It's like, well, it kind of doesn't work that way. So I do think there's a huge opportunity to create a, an ecosystem to help each other. Um, I do know that two of the big six are currently engaged with some sort of smaller, I'd say middleware players that are kind of fintech plays to help with a lot of this application processing from the uh, CRB uh, because they just don't have the ca capacity to actually turn their more waterfall development teams into like a quick agile play in short order. So they are, I know that this is actually happening in the market, which is really positive. Thanks for your insight in there. I mean, that's, uh, that's amazing to hear and it does a good job of answering you know, Zara's question. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And Corby, listen, really wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today. That was a ton of knowledge in a very compressed uh, part, amount of time. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Follow Product MA on Twitter and send us your topic suggestions. We look forward to seeing you soon.